think for me one of the scariest moments in making this whole film uh, was that I think when you when you finish you've you've obviously you've spent all this money and you've spent all these weeks doing it and there's not really anything physical you've got to show for it at that stage and then it goes uh, into editing and I wasn't involved in the first rough cut of the film at all I wanted to sort of take a step back and come back to it later and I was heavily involved from then on but one of the most nerve-wracking experiences of my entire life uh, is was sitting there sitting down to watch the first draft and uh, and and you know ha not really knowing whether I had a film and, and I had a total confidence in the script and the performances and the way we shot it and everything but you still don't know you know you still don't have you still haven't seen it together and you still don't know and, and sitting there and watching that first draft and, and sort of sitting back and, and, and sighing with relief and thinking well you know that we need to do this 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 and this but we have a film But thereafter, the post-production process was very long for this film, um, and that's because I mean there is a there is a real culture at the moment, particularly with digital filmmaking, of the, the idea that you can you know you can make a film in your bedroom, and that's true to some extent. But there is a certain level of finishing that needs to be done. I come from a writing background, so I was confident to write the film, um, uh, and that was my strength. Confidence. There are there are instances of low budget filmmakers using you know visual. They come from visual effect backgrounds, so they're very confident to use visual effects, editing, sound design. You know, it, you you play to your strengths, um, but there's always going to be areas where you do need professional input, and for us, post production was was one of them. And once we got a finished cut together, it needed that professional grade and the professional sound. This is now a year after the shoot um, and we, we're starting to really get the professional sort of finish to it um, uh, and that stuff was really exciting to do, um, you know, going to proper post-production facilities. Um, the sound was originally um, designed by uh, Andrew South who again is an extremely capable uh, sound designer and then we took it to be mixed um, professionally at uh, Dreambase Studios um, uh, which is a really really excellent I was really excited because I got to go to Dreambase and um, work with Alex Hudd who I later discovered worked on some of my favorite films um, 28 days later Shaun of the Dead um, you know films that really sort of mean a lot to me um, uh, he'd he'd been he'd worked on the sound crew and, and there we were making a full 5.1 mix um, in Dreambase studios <laughs> Visual effects is another one. Um, we did some, some of the visual effects was actually done by the first assistant director, uh, Toby Tompkins. Um, uh, some of the things like Infinari's fangs and some of the blood work and stuff like that. Some other stuff was done um, later on by different visual effects artists. We kind of bring people in for one shot. The problem with visual effects and for me the reason Aside from the aesthetic of it, the the reason I'd, I'd I'd always get it in camera is because then you know you've got it and you you don't have to worry about how long it's going to take. Music was a really interesting um, part of of making the film because I I'm personally I have you know very specific tastes in music and I'm quite sort of relatively musically aware. I was re I'm really grateful that we had such an excellent composer. I mean, I really think the soundtrack to this film is, is, is excellent. Um, and that was Jeremy Howard, our composer. And kind of, this you're walking this strange tightrope because you're not, you, you are not the creative doing this. You are not the person making this music. And, and I couldn't, to Jeremy's standards at all. I, I, I used to play in bands like everybody else on the face of the earth, but I don't have that level of kind of, musical ability so you're kind of operating through someone um, uh, and they are the creative they are the person making the making the work and he did such a great job of of translating my waffling kind of it's like this but a bit like this and it's it's this band but more like this guy from this band and you put uh, and, and translating that into something that not only worked as a, as a, as a piece of music but made sense for the story um, and made sense for what was going on in that time um, and there were lots and lots of rounds of music not not through anything to do with the composer's ability he was fantastic but I would tweak a lot and say can we make it a bit more heavy and can we um, again it was something we were limited on in terms of our resources it's quite difficult to get that big we had to keep the music quite sparse um, it's lots of single piano notes and long single violin sort of strokes and things like that because we didn't have that big orchestral 
you know, um, uh, thing behind us. We couldn't do big numbers. Um, uh, so we had to kind of try and work around that and keep it quite sparse, but keep it upbeat in the moments when it needed to be. Um, and so, yeah, that was a it's, a, it's a very interesting process directing the music in, in, in a film. The original score is, is, is a really interesting thing. <laughs>